I am Joseph Choma, the founder of the Design Topology Lab and an associate professor of architecture at Clemson University. I'll be sharing my research into foldable structures and materials. The way in which a problem is decomposed imposes fundamental constraints on the way in which people attempt to solve that problem. Rodney Brooks. So if I gave you a sheet of paper and I asked you to make a cube, you might cut six squares together or create a cruciform shape and fold the edges to create a cube like this, a cube with discrete sides and discrete edges. Well, if I gave you a ball of clay and asked you to make a cube with your hands, you might compress it in multiple directions, yielding a cube like this, a cube with rounded corners. So depending on which tool or medium is utilized will influence a set of possible results. This is directly tied to an idea called instrumentation, where an instrument or tool is used to record. However, the way in which something is recorded can also influence how we understand it. For example, this is a photograph by Andreas Feininger. We may think we know what the motion of a helicopter is and looks like, but when it's recorded in this fashion, we start to get a different meaning. To me, this doesn't just look like a photograph of a helicopter, but it looks like a drawing. It looks like a wireframe drawing. It looks like a tube of space. And I'm particularly interested in this representational abstraction of wireframes because it allows us to see the interior and exterior simultaneously. Similarly, if a painter was to record the presence of a person in space through a portrait, we could think of that as instrumentation. Or if an individual decides to do a recording of a famous work of art, like someone to create a painting of the famous Mona Lisa, that's also a form of instrumentation. However, this particular artist starts to do something a little bit more than that. They had additional rules and constraints. So now they're recording the Mona Lisa, but with one continuous line with a brush pen. And as they change the pressure of that brush pen, they're also changing the line weight or thickness. So here, this is an example of both translation, how it's not literally a perfect recording, but something changes through additional constraints, but it also shows how constraints can yield opportunities, which is something I'm fundamentally interested in. There are two kinds of scientific revolutions, those driven by new concepts and those driven by new tools. In the last 500 years, we have had five major concept-driven revolutions. During the same period, there have been about 20 tool-driven revolutions. Freeman Dyson. Now, I don't know about you, but in architecture, a lot of times they talk about whether you need an idea to begin or whether you should just begin. Is it concept driven or tool driven, the process of design? But in my opinion, they're more blurred than distinct. You know, in science, if you have a hypothesis, what do you do? You create an experiment and you test it. And then after you evaluate those results, you, de you define new hypotheses and you determine what to do next. On the other hand, if you don't know what to do, what I always tell my students is do something because the act of literally making or, or doing will likely generate ideas and new possibilities, especially if you carefully reflect on what has been done. So I think it's much more a back and forth dialogue than clearly just one or the other. When Freeman Dyson writes about this, he also specifically talks about an astronomer named James Bradley, who had quite a few contributions to the field of astronomy, but one in particular was done with an instrument maker named George Graham. And together, the two of them were the first to calibrate telescopes. And they actually calibrated that telescope to six degrees of accuracy. And this is the first time anything had ever been calibrated to that level of precision. And for me, and within my research, calibration is also very important. Sketching with mathematics. Sketching to me is a little bit different than just drawing. Usually when you make a particular kind of drawing, you're following a particular set of rules. For example, a one point perspective versus an axonometric versus an oblique or an elevation. Each of those have a different set of rules you follow to make those particular kinds of drawings. Well, when you sketch, sketching is less about pure recording and it's usually more about generating ideas through the act of making. And I like to use mathematics as a way to sketch as a means to generate ideas. And I see sketching as that which is in between a dream and reality. 
Now, this is the particular kind of mathematics which I'm interested in. Now, this is what we call a parametric equation, and I'm using trigonometric functions, sine and cosine. So x, y, and z, that's the Cartesian grid in space, and u and v are the parameters or the extent of the shape expressed. And here you're seeing a view of a torus or a donut. And so I'll start to break down parts of the equation so you can start to understand how I actually design with mathematical equations. The one and a half in front of the sign controls the radius. So as I increase it, the radius increases. If I change it to one, it kisses at the centroid. And if I eliminate it, we're back to the sphere. Now, if I look at the U and V, these control the extent of the shape. So as you can see, as I change that period, I begin to cut the shape in either direction. Next, by adding a V to the, U, to the sine U, we start to apply a twisting transformation. And then here, by placing a high frequency curve inside of a low frequency curve, we start to get what I call texturing. And here it looks more like a jitter. Well, if I make it another low frequency curve, now you get something that's more of an undulation, but both are fundamentally the same transformation of texturing. And then here, by placing the functions inside of a function of sine, we get flattening. So we're transforming that shape into the boundary of a cube. Now I'm gonna take some of these very simple transformations and I'm gonna apply them in such a way to make a design for pavilion. So I do texturing, then twisting, then flattening in the Z, then cutting. And here could be an elevation of a pavilion. And if I decide I wanna go a step further, maybe I'll see what happens if I twist it a second time. And here, once I've twisted it twice, now we start to get into ideas of duality or contested symmetries. Here's the single twist. Here's the double twist. Here's looking up at the single twist. And here's looking up at the double twist. Now when I look at this, there's also a ripple along the surface. And I'm particularly interested in these ripples because they become singularities or curves for our eyes to trace in, on this three-dimensional surface. And I could just at this moment stop and say, this is it, this is the design, I wanna build it, let's build it. And with our current means and methods, we could. However, just because we can build it with our current means and methods doesn't mean we should. So just because I could throw steel and cladding on that geometry to build it, maybe that's not the best way to do it. Maybe pure instrumentation isn't the right mentality. Maybe it should go through a process of translation and it should evolve and develop with rigor through additional constraints. So maybe those ripples don't wanna be what they are, but maybe they wanna be curved creases like this. And it wants to be folded. And this goes into my next question, which is what methods can be developed to translate continuous surfaces into folded structures, which can be mapped to two dimensional crease patterns. So I begin with something very simple, like a dome. And again, we're looking at a parametric equation and through again, the process of texturing, but by doing both a positive texturing and a negative texturing, we're able to have a shape like this, a shape with negative Gaussian curvature or a series of saddles. And in particular, I decide I wanna just look at one of these as a starting point, as starting with something quite simple as a means to recreate this with folding. And here you can see how it's negative curvature or that positive and negative as one arc points upward and one arc points downward. And the process I call this morphing crease patterns, where I'm starting with crease patterns that are known and I'm transforming it into new crease patterns. So the first crease pattern I look at is the one on the far left. This is a hyperbolic paraboloid or a saddle generated at the Bauhaus in 1927, a student of Joseph Alpers. 
This is the crease pattern. It's just a series of concentric squares all in between mountain and valley. Now, how did a student in Joseph Albers first year studio develop this crease pattern that's so sophisticated and creates a, such a sophisticated and complex shape? Well, Joseph Albers made over 100 paintings, which he called homage to the square. So each of these paintings were against a series of concentric squares. So it's only natural that he would ask his students to try folding concentric shapes. And then this is what it looks like when it's been folded. And here's the crease pattern. Then using computational geometry, it transforms to this. In the most simple sense, I call this fold finding, where I'm searching for crease patterns. And then here's the resultant geometry. And that initial surface or saddle generated with mathematics would be the center line geometry passing through this surface. Now, I wanna emphasize that this is not origami, but a folded structure. Origami is fundamentally based on undertucked folds, and it's not designed to resist structural forces. However, once you place a geometry that's folded with a specific orientation to gravity with the intent of carrying loads and the intent of it having material, actual material thickness built with actual materials, it is no longer just origami, but it's a folded structure. Now in architecture, we think we have a whole discourse called folded structures. However, most are not folded at all, but are fold inspired. For example, this is considered the world's first folded structure. However, in reality, it's a precast concrete structure. So at best, we would say this is fold inspired, or at least not folded like the way we literally fold paper. Similarly, within Engel's book, there's a whole chapter on folded structures. And these, these drawings we see here, they look like folded structures. However, they don't have a crease pattern, which means they were never intended to be literally folded. Instead, what they are is what we call folded plate structures, where planar elements are connected at some dihedral angle. Connecting planar elements at an angle is fundamentally different than literally folding planar material. And we have a lot of these folded plate structures that we see in history and in contemporary architecture including this one in Osaka, or this welded steel structure by Thomas Heatherwick. And these are quite elegant, but I am literally interested in folding something like the way we fold paper, but at the architectural scale. So why fold it? Well, as soon as you fold a sheet of paper, you create structural depth. And if you organize those folds appropriately, you can have flat packing capabilities. And lastly, there are numerous variations possible with one systematic method. So how can folding be used to disrupt an entire industry? And the particular industry I start to look at is the FRP industry, fiber reinforced polymers. Fiber reinforced polymers, we usually think of as fiberglass or carbon fiber. They're materials that have been around for a while. They have always been known for a great strength to weight ratio. However, it's only recently that the International Building Code has recognized it as a viable building material. It's also only within recent years that the American Composites Manufacturers Association has written the first guidelines and recommended practices for FRP materials for architectural products. Now, this doesn't necessarily suggest that this is the building material of the future, but it suggests that in the future, this will become a much more commonly used material for architectural applications. So what is the future for FRP materials? In the case of the San Francisco MoMA expansion, designed by Snowheda and Fabulary Chrysler Associates, this is an example, or this is the largest example of FRP materials used in the United States. And this was major advancement for the use of fireproofing technology. However, it's 710 parts that are made with 710 unique molds. Yes, we can do that. However, I don't believe the future of FRP materials being many unique molds, especially when a well-made mold can be used over a thousand times. On the other hand, David Reby of Windsor Fiberglass had designed a very 
carefully designed mold such that all the edges around that mold were the same. This allowed him to rotate particular modules or units to give the optical illusion of variation even though they are all the same part. To me, this is an intelligent way of using constraints to yield new opportunities. Then there are reconfigurable molds that allow for numerous variations possible with one machine. And this is adaptive, adaptable mold. And this is the kind of technology that's used a lot in the aircraft and automotive industry. However, it's a very expensive machine. It's not a machine that is accessible to everyone. And then we have the trajectory of no mold. And this is an example of research done at Stuttgart. And here they're using robotic arms and drones to weave carbon fiber and fiberglass together to create a, a beautiful structure like this. And I think this is a future. However, I think this is a high-tech future. And I wonder if there are also low-tech futures out there. So this is my low-tech method. Now that was a really simple technique. You take a dry fiber reinforcement fabric, you apply a mask, you paint on resin, you remove the mask, and you're left with flexible hinges that can fold. It seems so simple, almost trivial, in the sense that anyone can do it. Except for the fact that no one had ever done it before. And this is the first time fiberglass had been folded. And although this is a very low-tech manual technique, it could be fully automated. If we think of it as zone A and a zone B, this could be done with inkjet printing technology, where zone A is done with a resin that cures over time, while zone B is done with a B-stage resin that cures when exposed to a particular temperature or particular light. And I'm particularly interested in this dialogue between the high-tech and the low-tech, or the fully automated or that which is done by hand, because it provides a means for techniques and technologies to be accessible to everyone. So we're going from paper folding, to foldable composites, to foldable composite structures. And so one of my first proof of concepts was an arch. Here's the crease pattern. It's composed of 875 creases, mountain and valleys. And the one thing that's important to note here is all the parallel creases, which allow the structure to flat pack. Here's an image of the select encoding process. Here is the crease pattern. That's approximately 32 feet by 22 feet, possibly the world's largest crease pattern. And the entire structure flat packs to a width of less than 12 inches which meant it was easily carried on site with four individuals. And then it was deployed. And here you can see it deployed, where it's spanning 16 feet and has a material thickness of only 1 16th of an inch. So from there, the next question is, what are the constraints and limitations of translating paper folding into foldable composites? So can, is it possible that everything I fold out of paper can be folded with fiberglass? And I try to answer this question with another question. 
is it possible to fold fiberglass along curved creases? So again, I go to history, in the case of Joseph Albers at the Bauhaus, and here we're looking at a series of concentric circles, which form a saddle. Here's the crease pattern, and here it is folded and oriented towards gravity. And then if you increase it from eight concentric circles to 20, I find that you get a whole nother range of degree of freedom. And you can see my hand holding this model in this particular way that makes it asymmetrical. Now normally with paper, once you let go of it, it has a particular relaxed state or a state it wants to go to. But the beauty of fiberglass is I could potentially freeze any position I'd like. So is this possible? So here's the process for making that saddle. I take a dry fiber reinforcement fabric, I apply a mask, I paint on resin, I remove the mask, and then I fold it. So when I folded the concentric paper uh, with uh, 20 concentric curves, it took me over two hours to fold that paper model. But when I folded that fiberglass disc, it took us only three minutes. Now, why did it only take three minutes? And that was the first time we had tried folding it. We hadn't practiced. Why did it only take us three minutes to fold the large fiberglass disc? And that's because the fiberglass disc actually had it intelligence embedded within the material. There were zones that were clearly working as rigid, while others that were clearly working as flexible hinges. And you can see that in the image on the left, where there's a flexible hinge, and then there's a rigid surface, which is perfectly developable. And calibrating the width of those flexible hinges is something that was very important. So then from there, we can fix at any position, apply resin to the seams, and you can have a structure like this. Now, when I think back to the early sketch with mathematics, maybe that sketch of mathematics didn't want to be a torus. Maybe it just wanted to be a series of concentric circles like this. When you look at this one here, it has the idea of duality or contested symmetries. It has the notion of the ripple on the surface with the curved creases. So maybe this is just what it wanted to be. And you may be saying, okay, well, that's a sculpture, that's an object, but what are the potential architectural applications? And so for that, I go back to Le Corbusier's Maison Domino, which is a series of concrete slabs and concrete columns stacked on top of one another. And I start to question, you know, what would be the, what would the architectural elements of something like this look like? when you're incorporating FRP materials. And so first I start with a roof or a wall. So here's a crease pattern composed of mountain and valleys. It was inspired by the work of David Huffman. And when I look at this crease pattern, I don't just see a crease pattern, but I also see a reflective ceiling plan where each of those diamonds in space represent where columns would receive the ceiling. This is what it looks like when it's folded out of paper. And then this is what it looks like when it's been folded out of one sheet of fiberglass. And this is eight feet wide. And although I imagine this initially as a roof with columns receiving it, it also works as a freestanding wall. So this has a structural depth of approximately one foot. And here's a detail of one of the nodes. And again, you can see the precision and calibration in those creases. So then from there, I explore a column. 
So here is a column folded out of paper, and they have crease pattern adjacent to it. And then here is a column folded out of fiberglass. That's eight feet tall. And although I start out by critiquing the notion of the mold, after making this fiberglass column, I started to think, man, wouldn't this be a fantastic stay in place formwork for a concrete column? And maybe even my design for roof would be better as a stay in place formwork for a concrete slab, where the tensile reinforcement is exactly where it needs to be. And so future research will start to also explore how fiberglass can be incorporated with other materials. So key features of the fabrication technique for fiberglass include the potential for numerous variations, no fasteners or molds, a decrease in manufacturing costs through a production and production time and zero material waste, high portability and flat packing capabilities, the possibility to design stronger lightweight structures, Foldable composites have numerous potential applications, ranging from architecture, packaging, aerospace, product design, to the automotive industry. Folding can transform the way we design and build. Thank you very much.